Some years ago, we lived in a small town. One day, the mayor announced that an important politician would be visiting the town. There would be a gathering and the politician would deliver a speech in the town square. One thing, though, worried the mayor. The square had been badly neglected. So, a few days before the politician's arrival, the mayor sent a group of men to the nearby forest, and they brought out some tall palm trees. They opened deep holes in the ground around the perimeter of the square and installed the palm trees. The politician came, he gave his address, and he left. A few weeks later, however, the palm trees began to look distressed. The fronds dried up and fell to the ground. And so the mayor gave orders and the man took those palm trees away. The problem? The palm trees had no roots. Roots are important. Roots make a difference. What are our roots, particularly in terms of Christian education. The fundamental concept is that God has a plan. He has a plan for our lives, and he has a plan for education within our lives. Scripture says, the things that were recorded happened as examples and were written down as instruction for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. God, throughout history, established educational institutions as examples for us, as models of the divine plan of education. Many of these are recorded within Scripture. We will take a look at some of these examples of the divine plan for education and determine how these characteristics apply in our lives. We begin in the Old Testament with the very first school recorded in Scripture, the Eden School. When God created the world, he established three important institutions, the Sabbath, marriage, and education. In fact, God would come personally each day to spend time with his students. Ellen White wrote regarding the Eden School, the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden. There were a number of characteristics of this first school. God was the teacher. The setting was in a garden, the Garden of Eden, a natural setting. God's creation was the textbook. There were many different learning activities, but some of them involved work education. Adam and Eve were to care for the garden. There were also other learning activities. Adam, for example, as soon as he was created, was given a learning activity that involved high-level thinking. We might think that it would have been easier for God to simply inform Adam of the divine name for each of the creatures. But God asked Adam to name the creatures. This called for creative thinking. It seems that God values creativity above simple rote memorization. There was also evaluation in that first school. There was a tree of the test. Sadly, the first students distrusted their teacher and endeavored to obtain knowledge apart 
from God. That takes us to the first insight. We cannot obtain true knowledge apart from God. In fact, Scripture in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Although Adam and Eve, sadly, had to leave the first school, the good news is that their teacher went with them, and he helped them establish another school. The second school that we find in Scripture is the school of the patriarchs. Abraham is an example of this school. He taught his children and his extended family the ways of God. In fact, God says in Scripture, For I know him, that he will instruct his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment. Notice that Abraham focused on values, on character formation, a moral, ethical character. And he did this through two important ways. First, he taught by precept. He instructed them. But he also taught them by example. That is what the phrase means, after him. Abraham set the pace in his own life, and his children and household followed in his footsteps. The results of the school of the patriarchs were illustrious. In Hebrews 11, we find a number of them mentioned. Joseph, for example, developed a life of integrity. He also developed compassion, even for those who had wronged him. We also find Moses, who not only developed the ability to lead an entire nation free from slavery, but he was patient, long-suffering, and established a system of laws that governed an entire nation. An important insight from the School of the Patriarchs is that education that endures is when we teach our children by our example. That is why Paul could write, Follow me as I follow the example of Christ. Sadly, during the time of the 400 years slavery in Egypt, many parents forgot or simply ignored their divine commission to teach their children the ways and the character of God. And so, when God brought his people out of Egypt, he had to establish a remedial educational program. That program began that last night in Egypt, when God instructed the households, the parents of the families, to bring their children into their homes in order for them to experience salvation. This system, the school of the desert, mass education for God's people, involved an expansive curriculum. It included, for example, principles of hygiene, of diet, of interpersonal relationships. But the most important component of this curriculum was placed at the heart of the camp, and that was the sanctuary that was to illustrate the plan of salvation. Here students not only observed, but participated through experiential learning in an understanding of the plan of salvation. At the heart of the tabernacle was the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, and in the Ark of the Covenant was the law of God, the words of God, which are the foundation of true education. And there was an important role for parents. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
verses 5 through 7, describe this educational process that was to take place within the family. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Notice that love is the context in which the educational process is to take place. And this process involves the whole person. It involves the heart, the soul, the strength, and as Christ added, the mind. In addition, God said, These words that I command you this day shall be in your heart. God's words, the foundation of the educational program. But first, before we teach them, they must be in our heart. We simply cannot share what we do not have. Then the passage goes on to say, you shall teach them diligently to your children with perseverance, with excellence. And you shall talk of them in two important places. When you are in the house, but also when you walk by the way. That is, in the real experiences of life. God's words are to guide our interactions, guide our decisions in life. And then, there are two golden moments for learning. When you lie down and when you rise up. Moments when learning becomes particularly permanent. By the way, this is a scriptural basis for the importance of morning and evening devotional times. When we focus on the most important learning, learning of God and of His plan for our lives. And so, from the school of the desert, we also gain an important insight. Operating within a context of love, and involving the whole person. The words of God are to form the basis for the educational endeavor. These words, however, must first be internalized in the life of the teacher, of the parent, who then maximizes high potential moments for essential learning. We now turn to the fourth school recorded in the Old Testament, the School of the Prophets. These schools were established because, sadly, when God's people arrived in the Promised Land, many of the parents disregarded their divine responsibility to teach their children the way of God. And as a result, many of those children in their lives abandoned the worship of God. There was a need for revival and reformation, a need for spiritual leadership. And so the prophet Samuel established the first schools of the prophets. These were later expanded under the prophets Elijah and Elisha in places such as Jericho, Bethel, and Gilgal. Ellen White describes the program of studies at the schools. The chief subjects of study in these schools were the law of God with the instruction given to Moses, sacred history, sacred music, and poetry. Not only were the students taught the duty of prayer, they were taught how to pray, how to approach their Creator, how to exercise faith in Him, and how to understand and obey the teachings of His Spirit. There were also, in the curriculum, work education opportunities. The prophet Elisha, for example, accompanied his students as they worked together to expand the facilities of the school. And when teacher and students engage in the divine plan for education, together, miracles take place. An important insight from the School of the Prophets. 
to prepare a generation that will bring about revival and reformation. Students must experience the presence and the power of God. We could talk and examine together other schools in the Old Testament, such as the school of Jehoshaphat that had an impact on the lives of individuals such as Ezekiel and Daniel. But we turn now to the New Testament. The first school that we find recorded in the New Testament was a school of two teachers and only one student, the school of John the Baptist. The teachers in the school were John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. The school had a number of important characteristics. It was, first of all, a family school. It was also situated in a rural setting, and this seemed to contribute in an important way to the development of the student. The teachers were persons of prayer filled with God's Spirit. Principles of simplicity in diet and dress were part of the educational experience. The school prepared the student for a life of witness. In fact, we can see the results of this school in John the Baptist's life. He preached with courage. He addressed social injustices. But he was also a person of humility. Regarding Christ, he said, He must increase and I decrease. So we gain an important insight, and that is for a school to result in revival and reformation, such as in the case of John the Baptist, it must maintain a clear goal, and that is true education is that which prepares us for a life of witness with courage and humility. We now consider the second school mentioned in the New Testament, and that is the school where Jesus studied. Luke 2.52 describes Jesus' development. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Notice that it is a fourfold development. There are four important dimensions. The first is intellectual, then physical, the third spiritual development, and then social development. Each of these is an important dimension in whole person development, God's plan for education. Did Jesus attend the popular schools of his time? One day, when Jesus finished teaching, the people exclaimed, How does this man get such learning, having never studied? So, Jesus did not attend the popular schools of his time. Nevertheless, he was well educated. One time, after he had begun his ministry, when he returned to Nazareth, his hometown where he had been brought up, the scripture says that as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. This scripture not only indicates that it was Jesus' custom to attend worship services on Sabbath, but that he was also able to read. And not only that, it seems that part of his custom in attending the synagogue there in Nazareth was that he was the designated cantor, the one who would read the word of God to the community. In order to do this, the community would select a person who would read clearly, accurately, and with understanding. And it seems that Jesus was that person in Nazareth. How then did Jesus learn? Ellen White writes, the schools of his time, with their magnifying of things small, 
and their belittling of things great he did not seek. His education was gained from heaven-appointed sources, from useful work, from the study of the scriptures, from nature, and from the experiences of life. God's lesson books. So it seems that God has four important textbooks. Perhaps each one of these corresponding to one of the dimensions in which the student is to develop. Useful work, the scriptures, nature, and the experiences of life. These were the textbooks for the development of God's own son. But not only for Jesus. Ella White continues, full of instruction to all who bring to them the willing hand, the seeing eye, and the understanding heart. We see this evident in the life of Jesus. Thirty years of his life, his short life upon this earth, were spent in the development process. It began early, working in a carpenter shop. It continued throughout adolescence and as a young adult. But not only the work education component. He was also involved with observing nature, with reading scripture, with watching social interactions, and from these extracting divine insights, spiritual lessons. He also engaged in communication with God, his teacher. An important insight from this school, the school where Jesus learned. True education is whole person development that prepares us to respond to the divine plan for our life as it did for Jesus. The third New Testament school that we will examine is the school where Jesus taught. When God sent his son to this world, he sent him as a teacher. Ellen White writes, in the teacher sent from God, all true educational work finds its center. Most frequently, Jesus taught a small group of students, his 12 disciples. On other occasions, however, he taught multitudes, hundreds, thousands of people. Yet, at other times, he taught in a very personable way, one on one. In fact, it was the personality of Jesus that caused him to be so effective in his teaching. He was accessible to his students. He associated with them. They ate together. He was sensitive to their needs. He created context of joy. He would invite his students to experience success. For example, to those who were fishermen, he said, Come with me, and I will make you fishers of men. He also conveyed to each student the value that he placed on their life, even those who were ostracized, marginalized by society. Most importantly, however, Jesus was a person of prayer. And this seems to have a direct result in his teaching. Sometimes he would pray in the evenings, sometimes in the mornings, and sometimes throughout the night. And the results of Jesus' teaching were significant. One day, after he finished teaching, the people exclaimed, Nothing like this has ever happened in Israel. On another occasion, when the chief priest sent the temple guards to arrest Jesus, they returned empty-handed and reported, We have never heard anyone speak like this. True education, thus, leads us to become disciples and disciples 
disciple makers of Christ. We turn now to the fourth and final school of the New Testament that we will examine together, the school of the early church. The school began when Christ gave to his disciples the gospel commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Notice that the process begins with discipleship. Making disciples then leads to salvation, to experiencing God's amazing grace in our lives. But that is not the end of the educational process, because after the student accepts God, there is instruction teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. We can see, for example, this process taking place with Philip and the Ethiopian. The Holy Spirit guides Philip and tells Philip, come close to the student. Philip then asks a question, do you understand what you are reading? And that leads to a conversation. Philip joins the student on his journey. And there, beginning with that very passage, the point that the student was studying, Philip, the teacher, presents the good news about Jesus. And as a result, the student's life is changed. Another example is Paul. Paul would instruct a number of young people individuals that he took with him on his missionary experiences. Timothy was one of those young men. He not only accompanied Paul, but he learned to share the gospel with others. This educational process in Timothy's life, however, did not begin with Paul as his mentor. It began much earlier in his home, in his family, where Timothy studied the scriptures. In fact, Paul, writing to Timothy, says, I recall your genuine faith, the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. You have been taught the holy scriptures. Paul also provides more general counsel for all parents in this educational process. And he says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So, in the school of the early Christian church, parents also have a vital role to perform. And that takes us to an important insight. True education integrates the Word of God, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, preparing us for the work of the gospel. We have talked together about roots, about the divine illustrations, examples of God's plan for education that He has provided in Scripture. But there is something else. We also need to look toward the horizon, toward the future, because there is yet one more school mentioned in the Bible, and that is the school of heaven. This school has characteristics that are very similar to the Eden school. God again instructs directly the students. The setting, again, we can have access to the Garden of Eden. Nature, God's creation, is again an important textbook. And again, we engage in work education, building houses, and planting vineyards. The fact that the school of heaven is very similar to the Eden school should be no surprise. After all, the Eden school was simply an example, an illustration of the school of heaven. However, 
there's one important aspect of the Eden school that is not present in the school of heaven, and that is evaluation. There is no more a tree of the test, because all those who enter the school of heaven have passed the test. There is something, however, that takes the place of evaluation, and that is witness. Those who are redeemed will share with the inhabitants of the unfallen worlds their experience of God's grace. And that testimony, that witness, will make the universe secure forever. The life of heaven begins here on this earth. For this, we need a preparation that fulfills the divine plan in our lives. Imagine that you have an old vehicle, and for some of us, that's not too difficult. An old car that seems to use about as much oil as gasoline. One day, you decide to check the oil, and as you look at the dipstick, you notice that of the five quarts that the motor should contain, it's lacking one quart. But as you look at the end of the dipstick, you notice something else. The oil in the engine is very dirty. But you go and you bring a quart of fresh new oil and you pour it into the engine. What is the result? Five quarts of dirty oil. Sometimes we may be tempted to think that it's enough to simply go and worship one day of the week. And then the rest of the week, we live our life in a secular frame of reference. Or to think that we can go and sit at the feet of God one day a week. And then the other days, we partake of an education where God is not a part. Perhaps that's why Ellen White wrote, all our youth should be given an education that will strengthen them in the faith. And for this to take place, she adds, in all our churches, there should be schools and teachers in those schools who are missionaries, educating the children of Sabbath keepers, not only in the sciences, but in the scriptures. The prophet Isaiah wrote, All your children shall be taught by God. Not simply about God. Rather, God is the teacher. Then the prophet adds, And great shall be the peace of your children. That word translated peace in the original, in the Hebrew, is shalom. And certainly, it includes the concept of peace. But it means much more. Well-being, prosperity, health, security, and safety. Isn't that what we want for our children? Isn't that what we want to experience in our own lives? But there is a condition. We must be taught by God. That is why in Christian education, to educate is to redeem. It is to experience God, His grace in our lives, to sit at His feet, to understand the plan that He has for us. And this education, a preparation that follows the divine model, will prepare a generation to share the gospel in the whole world. It will prepare a people who are ready to meet Christ at His second coming. And then we will hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have committed to follow the divine plan in your life. Enter the joy of your Lord.